Matt Bauer with us today. He uh, has lots of knowledge about intellectual property and how to protect it. Uh, so take it at, take it away, Matt. Okay, great. Well, great to meet everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Matt Bauer. I'm a, a partner with the Varnum Law Firm. I work out of our Ann Arbor office. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, my, my practice focuses both on, I have a sort of a blend of both corporate work and intellectual property work. So I actually work with um, you know, companies that have oftentimes a core piece of their, uh, their product is a piece of intellectual property. Uh, but throughout the years, I've worked in a number of creative industries, um, photography uh, principally, uh, licensing and protection, um, and uh, um, you know, as well as multimedia, um, advertising. So a lot of creative fields. Um, and so I have been tasked today to give you guys a, a little bit of a primer on intellectual property law, but I thought what we'd really do is do a, more of a deep dive in copyright law. And so at first, let me just lay out sort of the intellectual property landscape. Um, so it's important to know that there's really four types of key intellectual property. Um, the first, and it's probably the largest and um, the, the one that gets the most activity is patent law. And patent law protects inventions. So if you think about the better mousetrap you built, or if you're building cabinets, the better, you know, sort of hinge that you've created, um, patent law will protect your invention. And, and if other people want to use your invention, they have to pay you a royalty for it, right? Or purchase the patent from you. Uh, the other area of intellectual property law is trademark law. Trademark law protects um, names and symbols, right? So anything that identifies a trademark owner, you know, so if you think about, um, uh, you know, uh, names of products or even colors that can, can symbolize a product like Tiffany blue or UPS Brown, um, certain sounds that can identify a product, you know, like do, 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 which is the, uh, you know, the symbol for, uh, uh you know, um, I think it's ABC or NBC, one of those, one of the C's. In any event, um, uh, trademark law will protect that symbol so that it, only that symbol, whatever it might be, identifies, say, you or your product um, so that others can't copy that to kind of trade off of your the goodwill of, of your name or your logo. Um, then there is copyright law, which we will do a deeper dive into today. Law protects creative... This, um, since this is a law that primarily protects you and your work. Um, copyright law is going to protect um, original expressions of artistic creativity. We'll talk a little bit more detail. Um, but things like books and movies and TV shows and uh, music, um, all of these things are, all of these artistic expressions are protected by copyright law. And then finally, there's an area of intellectual property that we refer to as trade secrets. And this is a, an area of intellectual property that is, has more commercial value. And it's for you know, businesses typically, where they have some kind of information that they keep secret that gives them a competitive advantage in their industry. That could be things like customer lists, right? Or um, you know, the secret ingredients to um, your, your cookies or, or, or um, your product or how it's made. Um, now, all four of these are not distinctive in that they are mutually exclusive. They can cover multiple um, uh, products or goods. So if you imagine an old-fashioned bottle of Coca-Cola, um, the symbol on the outside of the Coca-Cola, the, the color red in the script Coca-Cola, it's all protected by trademark law. The shape of the bottle, to the extent that it's easier to hold, right? Or maybe the bottle cap, to the extent that it's an improvement on previous bottle caps. Those could be protected by patent law. Then there is the ingredients in the, uh, the Coke bottle itself um, that uh, are protected by trademark law, right? We have the secret for Coke formula. 
And then finally, the shape of the bottle can also be protected by copyright law to the extent that it's direct, uh, it's decorative, and it is um, some piece of, um, uh, you know, artistic uh, creation. Um, so with that, let's do a deeper dive into copyright law. And if I can, I will share my screen. Okay, terrific. So we're going to go over some copyright law basics. So uh, know about copyright actually in the Constitution itself. It's important enough to the Constitution power and, uh, and says to promote the progress of science and useful arts to authors and inventors the exclusive right to the re their respective writings and discoveries. What's important to note here is that uh, what the founders thought was important was that they're giving Congress this ability to grant rights to authors and inventors um, for the purpose of promoting the science and useful arts. So artists have rights as far as the Constitution is concerned, in part because the founders thought it was important that if artists had these rights, they could use these rights and commercialize them in order to um, make money for themselves. And that this is going to be a mechanism by which we will get more artwork, right? So they weren't so much concerned about, you know, artists having inherent rights to their work. What they were really concerned about is making sure that artists were monetarily um, compensated for their artwork, or they could be through exercise of their rights. So what does copyright law protect? Well, it protects original works of authorship. And in order to be an original work of authorship, there has to be independent uh, creation. Um, so that means that uh, it's not purely copying something else, that there's uh, you've created it independently, and that there's a modicum of creativity. So this is a very, very low bar for what constitutes uh, creative works. And then finally, it has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression, so more than transitory duration. This is more of an evidentiary matter to make sure that we have, um, you know, concrete uh, evidence of what you've created. It has to be fixed in some sort of form. So if that's making music, it has to be in a recording. If it's a painting, it needs to be on a canvas, you know, a photograph. It can be held digitally as long as it can be reproduced. So this was an early copyright case uh, invo involving uh, uh, this very kind of odd picture of Oscar Wilde. So um, photography was relatively new at the time that Oscar Wilde was beginning to make his rise. Um, and uh, a photographer took a pic this picture of him. Uh, later, there was a case involving someone's use of the photograph. And the person who used it said, well, there shouldn't be a copyright in this because, you know, obviously it's just a reproduction. You used a machine in order to just reproduce this image. And so there wasn't any creativity here. Um, the court disagreed. He said, no, while the machine, the, you know, the, the, um, the camera is doing uh, some of the work there, the camera can't do anything on its own. So the, uh, the person taking the photo has to make some certain um, artistic choices. For example, they chose to give Oscar Wilde this book and maybe pose him in this weird way and also to place him on these, you know, these, uh, I don't know, these rugs and, and chairs. So um, there was decisions made by the photographer in making this, and that was enough to give rise to a modicum of creativity. As far as transitory duration goes, again, it has to be fixed in some sort of form so that the original. So if you made a snowman, you needed like this person did here, or this beautiful, you know, sort of, or strange, depending on your taste, um, you know, sculpture made out of sand. You know, these will not last. Eventually the sun will come up. Eventually the wind will blow this away. Um, and so in the absence of some kind of capturing it in some way, no copyright would exist in this. So someone viewing the, you know, the sand sculpture might be able to go off and do their own. if They could remember it correctly um, if there was no uh, um, uh, fixed expression of the original. Likewise, I've got this little picture of these jazz musicians. Um, it's important to note that, you know, if you're in a band and you guys are riffing and you come up with a, you know, really nice little jingle, if you're not recording it, if someone else hears it and they can go off and reproduce it if, they're, if that was never fixed. Again, it's an evidentiary matter. You could say, well, that person ripped off my, uh, my jingle that I came up with. 
Uh, but if there isn't any evidence that it had actually been created in the first place, you don't get protection for it. So what does copyright law protect? Um, what, well, what does it not protect? Um, so it doesn't protect works that are in the public domain. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but those are works that they fell out of copyright. Copyright has a specific duration. It's not going to protect, as we noted, non-original or non-fixed works, right? Um, it also doesn't protect titles, names, short phrases, or slogans, although those things that we, just, we discussed can be protected under trademark law. Um, it doesn't uh, protect familiar symbols or designs, again, because it lacks the kind of creativity that's necessary. Uh, mere variations of topographic ornamentation, lettering, or coloring, mere listings of ingredients or contents. It also doesn't protect ideas, um, procedures, methods, systems. Um, with this, but the, in the in the case of ideas, you know, um, you know, copyright law will protect if I paint a picture of a flower, but I don't get exclusive rights over all pictures of flowers. Anyone can paint a picture of a flower. In fact, somebody else could come along and paint a picture of the same flower that I painted a picture of, and they will have a separate copyright in their expression of that flower. Um, so you might come up with a an interesting idea for a painting the copyright law is only going to uh, protect the expression of that idea and, and not the painting itself, or not the subject matter of the painting. So mere listings of ingredients. So uh, yeah, recipes for, uh, say, um, in this case, it's chili, are not going to be protected. Um, although what might be protected on this page are, you know, the picture of the chili, right? Or the description of the chili. Um, those things are expressions that will be protected, but just the mere ingredients will not. Um, so I'm going to stop here for a second and just pause and talk about melodies. Um, so you'll often see the people, um, well, I should back up. It used to be the case under copyright law that in order to get protection, you had to follow certain formalities. Um, the modern Copyright Act, and by modern, it was 1976, um, it did away with those kinds of formalities. So uh, before you had to, um, you know, before you published a work, you had to have a copyright notice on it. You had to register it with the copyright office. You had to deposit a copy with the, um, uh, the copyright office. And, and if there was any transfers, you had to make sure those were recorded. And if you didn't do any of those things, you didn't get copyright protection. Uh, the 1976 Act said, you know what, that's just too onerous. Uh, we want more people to have protection. And so what they did is they, they said, you know, you can get some additional rights if you follow formalities, but you're not going to lose copyright protection. Um, and copyright will protect your work as soon as it's created. You do not have to register your work, although it is a good idea to register your work with the copyright office, um, particularly if you're doing reproductions and, and want to, you know, commercialize it, um, because you do get additional rights. And that includes rights to what's called statutory damages if someone commits copyright infringement against you. It's also wise to continue to use that C with the circle and have your name in the year that you created it and put that on your artwork so that people are on notice that you are claiming a copyright in your work. It again also means that if someone um, you know, copies your work or, or uh, commits infringement against you in some way, then you might have additional remedies against them because you did follow these formalities. So, so what types of works get protected? We talked about this a little bit. The literary works, musical works, dramatic works, uh, choreographic works, pictorial graphic and sculptural works, motion pictures or just audiovisual works, sound recordings, and architectural works. What kind of rights do you have as an artist? Um, well, once you have a copyright in an artwork, you have the right, the exclusive right, um, to reproduce that and make copies of it. No one else can make copies of it without getting a license from you. Um, prepare derivative works or adaptations. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, distribute the work. So once you've made your copy, you're the only one that can distribute that, but that's that's on the first sale. You know, if I've created a painting, um, no one else can distribute that painting except for me. Um, uh, once I've distributed it, though, uh, the first distribution, whoever then owns it, owns the physical object that is the artwork, but they don't own the copyright in it. And they could distribute it, you know, they could resell it if they wanted to at that point but no copyrights have passed. Um, an import, uh, similar to distribution, 
uh, to protect um, works that are created overseas. To publicly perform a work um, uh, for certain types of works, you know, primarily, um, you know, uh, music, right? Um, publicly display um, works. Uh, so if you've created a work, um, you can't make it, uh, you have the exclusive right to make that available to the public um, in a, a way of public display. Um, in some cases, there's also a right of attribution and integrity. So for visual artists who have a certain level of distinction, um, they have what's called rights under what's called the, the Visual Artist Rights Act. And anyone who is um, displaying those works uh, or is given permission to distribute them, they have to give the artist um, attribution, that is credit for the work, um, to name the artist with the work, and integrity to make sure they're not um, destroying the work. Recordation or record and, and transmit performances. This is an anti bootlegging right. So it means that artists who are performing live um, can prevent others from recording their performance at the time. So derivative works. A derivative work is a transformation of an existing work. So imagine a book being transformed into a movie. It's being moved from one medium to another. Um, and copyright law likewise gives the uh, artist the uh, right to um, uh, grant licenses to create derivative works. Um, it's not just books and movies, though. I mean, if you consider something like um, Sunday in the Park, Park with George, which is a, a musical based on a George Surratt painting. Just so happens the painting was in the public domain, so uh, Stephen Sondheim did not need a license from the artist in order to create a musical based on it. Um, but if it weren't, um, George Surratt would have had an exclusive license, license uh, exclusive right to that kind of derivative use of his painting. And so Stephen Sondheim would have needed a, uh, a license from him. Uh, so copyright um, exclusive rights are not, uh, how we say, um, they're not unlimited. Um, there are some limiting doctrines uh, where copyright law will not protect um, in certain areas. Um, so the first is what's called the idea expression dichotomy. We'll get to that in a minute. Design of useful articles. Works of the federal government are not protected by copyright law. The first sale doctrine, which we discussed. So you get the exclusive right for the first sale, but not for any sales after that of the physical objects embodying the copyrighted work. And then something called scenes affair. Um, we'll touch on each of these real quickly. So the first is the idea expression dichotomy. And basically what this says is if you cannot ex uh, separate the idea from the expression, um, then we can't grant copyright protection to it. Um, so this is an example of that. This was an artist in Florida um, who started encasing um, jellyfish into these glass orbs. Um, this became very popular for a period of time. And then the artist uh, began to see reproductions um, showing up. By reproductions, there were other artists uh, who said, well, these are really popular. We will also capture jellyfish and then encase them in glass and sell them in, um, uh, you know, as artwork. Um, he sued, but because you couldn't separate the idea of putting a jellyfish in glass from the expression being a jellyfish in glass, um, they, they, he could not get copyright protection um, for this work. Another one, the, the last one we talked about is scenes of fair. Um, basically, um, what this means is, you know, your standard building blocks of, of certain genres of works. Um, so there was a case involving a book uh, called Fort Apache, the Bronx, New York. Um, it was written by a retired police officer um, talking about his time uh, working as a police detective in the Bronx. And then you had the Paul Newman movie come out um, called Fort Apache, the Bronx. And uh, Tom Walker, who wrote the novel, sued the makers of the film saying, you basically, uh, you created a derivative work, right? You took my book and then you turned it into a movie. Um, there were significant differences between the book and the movie. Um, both, of course, involve a police detective. They both in involve a location, Fort Apache, the Bronx. They both involved a certain area at that time, I think it was in the late 1970s, um, where crime was particularly high. Um, and there were some other similarities, but what the court, court pointed out is, look, you've got two stories regarding two sort of stock characters, police, policemen, um, working in a similar location uh, at a, during a similar time. 
there are certain scenes of fair, certain things that are just by their very nature of a, of a movie like this or a book like this that you're just going to see, which could be drug busts and arrests um, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so you, uh, what the court said is that the artist here, the, the writer, really couldn't protect these kinds of standard, um, uh, standard stock characters and storylines um, within this genre of fiction. Uh, also mentioned that useful articles are not protected, although, again, they could be protected under patent law. Um, so in under copyright law, though, um, useful articles are not protected where the copyrightable element cannot be separated physically or conceptually from the utilitarian aspects of the article. I'm going to show an example in a minute. Or it is protected when the design is primarily aesthetic rather than functional. So here's two examples. So this is a interesting bike rack that was created with these long looping um, uh, hoops um, or half circles. Um, so the question is, you know, is that going to be protected under copyright law? Um, it does have a utilitarian aspect, which is uh, it's useful for, you know, sort of locking up bicycles. Um, but it also has an aesthetic aspect, um, which is you certainly don't there's nothing particularly utilitarian about creating a bicycle rack in this way. And so the question is, will the artistic uh, parts of this, can we separate those from the utility of the bike rack? Um, likewise, you have some rings here. A ring by its very nature has no utility. It's purely decorative. Um, so as long as there's some artistic expression here, which I think we'd have in our, um, you know, this modicum of creativity on the, uh, the picture on the right side. Um, then it's going to be protected under copyright law, the design is. So those were the rights. This is uh, goes to copyright ownership. So initially, copyright will vest in the author or authors of the work. Um, so if you've created the work and you're the author, copyright automatically vests in you as the author of that work. Um, there are There could be joint works. There could be a work that you create with somebody else in which case you guys will own the work jointly. We'll cover that in a minute. There's what's called collective works. So I could uh, ask everyone on the, on the Zoom call today to uh, write an essay, and then I could collect all those essays and put them in a collection, right, and publish that separately. I would have to get a license from each of you, right, to reproduce your work. But once I got a license from each of you and I collected those together, the collection itself is protected under copyright law. Um, and so my selection of the essays and the topics and collecting and selecting them and, and assembling them into a final product is itself a separately copyrightable work. And then there's what's called the work made for hire doctrine, um, which you may have heard of and which I'll go into in a little bit more detail. Um, very important doctrine for understanding your rights. So under the work made for hire doctrine, um, there's two, uh, there's two situations. The first is um, when an employee acts within the scope of their employment, the copyright and the work that they create automatically vests in their employer. So this is a, an exception to the rule that the creator owns the copyrighted work. If you are an employee and you're working for an employer, the employer is going to own the copyright and the work that you create if it's within the scope of your employment. These are all very traditional concepts. So it would be, you know, employees receive W-2s that have a workstation that are assigned work, uh, right? And then do that work for their employer. Uh, their employer is going to own the copyright and what they create. Um, the other situation is uh, for independent contractors. So in order for an independent contractor's work to be owned by the person who commissioned, commissioned it, there, it has to be specifically ordered or commissioned, right? And then it has to be a certain class of work, usually a visual artist, uh, visual, uh, audiovisual work, collective work, tests, maps, translations, um, very specific category of work. And then the parties have to expressly agree in writing. Um, what makes this important is that you'll notice that there's a limited number of classes of works that can qualify as a work made for hire. So if I commission you, that's not a work made for hire. And so the copyright will not vest in me specifically as the person who commissioned that work. If I want the copyright, rather than making a work made for hire, 
we have to agree separately that you are assigning your copyright to me. So just if, if you're an independent contractor and unless there is uh, something in writing that says it's a work made for hire, and if it meets these categories, um, it's not gonna transfer in the absence of there being some other um, agreement between the artist and the person commissioning the work that says that the rights will transfer. Um, so that's important for you to know. Um, it protects a lot of artists um, so that they're not uh, inadvertently transferring copyright in their work. Um, and so it's important to know that in any agreements that you have, what are the rights in the underlying copyright of the work? If I hire you to come over to my house to paint a mural and you paint that mural and I pay you, in the absence of the, an agreement between the two of us, um, I own sort of the physical embodiment of that artwork. So I could, you know, take down my wall and the artwork and move it around in my house if I wanted to. Um, but I don't own the copyright in it. And so I can't print t-shirts of it or put it on coffee mugs or license the rights to anyone else. Um, joint authors. In order to be a joint author, there, there has to be an understanding at the beginning that the two um, uh, authors are working together in order to make a unitary whole work. Um, and then each must uh, contribute uh, essentially you know, copyrightable content. So again, it has to have a modicum of expression and not just ideas. This came up most famously in a case involving uh, the musical Rent. Um, Rents is musical uh, written by um, uh, Jonathan Larson. Uh, Jonathan Larson famously died shortly before Rent um, uh, sort of did its um, did a debut, and it was later picked up and brought to Broadway. Uh, the Broadway producers made a fantastical amount of money off this, um, but but Jonathan Larson had worked with someone, a research assistant, which in musical theater terms is called a dramaturg. Um, this assistant was helping Jonathan Larson. Um, with some re research, um, uh, editing, um, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, the, the research assistant, assistant was able to show, though, that she had contributed more than just some ideas to it, that she actually contributed some lines of dialogue. Um, and so this was enough that eventually the producers settled um, with, the, with the dramaturg. Um, it's important to note, you know, that when you're working and collaborating with someone on a work, um, what is the intention of the parties? Do you, do you want this person to be a joint uh, author with you, or are they merely there to assist you um, in you creating your work, um, which will be your copyright? If you are considering being a, a joint author with uh, another artist, um, another thing to consider is that, um, uh, it can it can create kind of a little bit of a sticky situation. So um, what that means to be a joint author is that both of the artists own the whole, right? Um, and that they get to exercise um, all the rights of a copyright owner in the whole, um, with some exceptions, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so they're not liable to the other, other author for copyright infringement for using the work themselves. Um, they may have a state law duty to account for any profit. So if, if, if you and I create a work together and I license that work for money, I may have to account to you for your half of those uh, proceeds um, from the commercialization of it. Um, as a co-author in any kind of licensing, but I can't exclusive licenses. Uh, our, uh, we need the other um, artist author in order to grant license to somebody else. Um, I can also interest right can't again sell the whole work because complexities and joint relationships i mostly advise clients in joint author uh, uh, um, because of all the involved and, and and all logistics that have to work out are we going to count to each other and integrity to each other um how are we going to count and pay those. You're much better off creating work and want the assistance of somebody else to engage them on a work made for hire basis, uh, whereby they're going to also assign any copyright uh, to you for exploitation. So the term of protection, how long do you get to uh, exercise your rights? Um, they last, for now anyway, uh, for the life of the author plus 70 years. 
This means that once an author dies, that uh, that author's heirs um, can also exercise the copyright um, and, and, and exploit the copyrightable works. Um, for corporations, it's 120 years from the date of creation. Now, fair use. Um, I could probably spend uh, eight hours talking about nothing but fair use um, and, uh, and, and probably still not do a great job of explaining it to you. Um, fair use uh, really cuts to, um, we talked about that very first slide, um, the whole point of, of um, copyright law, and that's to promote the progress of science and useful arts. And what courts began to recognize is that these exclusive rights are a monopoly. And sometimes that kind of lockdown of rights um, can actually prevent the very thing that the copyright statute is meant to um, promote, right? That if the, these exclusive rights are completely locked down, um, we may be missing out on other creative works um, that are incorporating copyrightable material um, under very specific circumstances. So um, I guess the other way to say it is, as this slide says, fair use is one of the most significant ways the Copyright Act allows a person other than the copyright owner and its licensees to use a copyrighted work without authorization. So courts have generally found that the nature of the defendant's use involves two inquiries. You know, whether the use is of a commercial nature or is it non-commercial in nature and whether the use is transformative. Um, I would propose that the commercial, non-commercial use of the work is probably less important. What's more important is whether or not that use was, as we say, transformative. In order for a use to be transformative, there's something new has to be added. Uh, to the underlying copyrighted work. It can't be a mere reproduction. There has to be some other um, useful purpose. And so it has to have some different function, purpose, or character other than the original. So I'll talk about a couple cases involving um, Jeff Coons. Um, this was a, a, a case, um, Rogers versus Coons. So Rogers is the photographer. Rogers took a traditional black and white photo of these two uh, people that are holding a, a litter of puppies. Um, this is Coons's interpretation of that photograph. He took the photo, he added this weird coloring, he made the dogs, you know, blue or purple. Um, he put them in kind of these loud colors and then, you know, um, and, and kind of gave them these sort of like plastic expressions on their faces. Um, Rogers uh, sued uh, Coons and he wound up prevailing. What the court said in this case is like, well, look, you know, uh, Mr. Coons, all you really did was make a reprint. Doesn't, it's not really transformative. We're not really getting anything. Coons uh, rebutted, of course. I mean, his argument they on sort of and in our society, elevating this photo, um, which is, you know, otherwise pretty pedestrian into some fine work of art by um, making it more acidic, right? And, and almost sort of nightmarish. Um, and um, in doing so, he sort of is pointing out um, sort of the absurdity of it and the, uh, the materiality involved here. Um, again, court didn't agree with him on that one. And so it was found to be copyright infringement. Jeff Coons, not to be outdone, has another case involving him not that long after. Um, this is Blanche versus Coons. So here Coons took um, some photographs um, of uh, women's feet from, I think it was Glamour magazine. In any event, it was some glossy magazine. Um, feet in this photograph uh, are reproductions from uh, advertisements and photos in the magazine. Um, and then he took them and he placed them in sort of this collage with these got these donuts to the left. And I don't, I don't know what those quite are to the right, but more pastries and um, looks like a pastry behind them. And then there's sort of like this, this odd kind of uh, terrestrial landscape behind it. And here the court actually agreed with Coons. He said, um, well, first, the, the reproduction of the feed is, is not a pure reproduction of the photograph. It's only taking a part of the photograph from these magazines. Um, and then it is placing them in these odd contexts and, and moving them around. 
Um, and, uh, you know, for this reason, it's a transformative work because we're getting a new artistic expression using these building block materials from this glossy magazine. Um, there's been a lot of criticism of these two cases, in part because I really don't feel that they're all that distinguishable. Um, I think a case can easily be made that this photograph is transformative as much as, um, you know, the feet from the magazine are. Um, and the reason why I point this out is just to point out how fickle fair use is. Um, sometimes how a case comes out might depend on what the, what the judge had for breakfast that morning. Um, and so it's important to note that copyright while a, perhaps a useful tool for artists, if oftentimes all it does is give you the right to hire a lawyer, right? So you get to use the fair use defense as a defense against copyright infringement, um, but that's all it is, it's defense, it's not a force field. You still have to protect yourself um, to sometimes in court, particularly if you're uh, as famous as Jeff Koons is. And so with that, that is my broad overview of um, copyright law. And um, I think I did pretty good here since I'm coming in right at uh, 30 minutes, I believe. Happy to take any questions. I just want to tell you to say hello to everybody. I ain't too long to log in into the meeting. I just want to tell everybody hello. Is I want to ask, what is avoided when you create your artwork for copyright? I'm sorry, say that again? What is avoided when you do your work for art? It has to be original and... It has to be original and has to be fixed, yeah. How does it be fixed? So it, it has to be um, in order to be able to recreate it, right? Or, or to, um, and to show, uh, to show your work. Um, so if you've created something and someone's copied that and violated your copyright, we need to be able to see the original so that we can compare it with the reproduction. Um, so in the case of uh, music, it has to be recorded. In the case of a painting, it has to be on a canvas. Uh, or you have taken a photograph of it at some point um, so that we have a record of the original creation. Okay. Thank you. Most, most of my work is uh, photo, photos of clouds and trees and landscapes. And uh, just wondering uh, if someone owns a property, is it infringing it if you change it a little bit? Uh, if you're doing a, a, a painting of someone else's, say, backyard or, or forest. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly what he's asking, Matt. Okay. So, like, um, in his picture, uh, in his avatar, he's got somebody's house and some, you know, trees and clouds. And then he tends to, uh, you know, Photoshop them with color and so on. And, you know... I, I think uh, alter them pretty severely sometimes, but does he owe any allegiance to the person that owns that property? <laughs> uh, no, he doesn't. Um, for one, you know, the person who owns that property, uh, they're not authors of the trees, right? Uh, even, you know, their home, um, they're not authors of the home. He, architect that created that, but there's actually an exception under copyright law that um, there is no protection for, uh, for co you're allowed to take pictures of buildings, right? They didn't want people to have to like go out and grab licenses from the architects every time you want to take a picture of say the Empire State Building. Um, so you can paint a picture, you can take a picture of buildings. You don't, you're not violating the architect's copyright in that reproduction um, of the building itself. Um, so no, you don't, um, you don't owe the owner of the property. Now, you get into other areas of law, right? If you have to hop over a fence and, you know, traverse, you know, a quarter mile to get to a spot on private property to take a picture, um, you, you, it's not going to be a violation of any copyright, but you might be violating trespass and rights of privacy. Um, likewise, if you, you know, take the uh, picture of someone 
you know, in a private setting, uh, privately in their home without permission, you might be in violating their, their privacy rights. So with music, you know, it's, it's ephemeral. I understand it's a simple solution to record something to, to uh, you know, sort of timestamp it, right? But um, with a lot of music, you might just have like a lead sheet, like a, a composer, a jazz composer is not going to write every note because that's not how it works. Yep. So you write the tune, you have your chord progression, you have your melodic line and all of that. So you have a lead sheet and that's it maybe you don't have any recording of it do you still have copyright uh ownership yeah so the lead sheet to the extent that again it's original and there's some creativity there um that is going to protect that alone um it will only protect it to the extent that you know the lead sheet is recording the notes right um uh, but music is also one of those areas of copyright law a lot like fair use um, where I could spend hours talking about how it works. There's a lot of mechanical rules when it comes to copyright law for, for music. Um, one important thing to note is that with music, uh, the sheet music is separate from the recording. Those are two separate copyrights. So, you know, if you're in Tin Pan Alley in the 1930s and you're, you're creating sheet music, right, for other artists to sing, you're standing over a piano, you know, usually with a green visor on uh, and, uh, and making, um, you know, making notations on the piece of paper. You'll have a copyright in the song that you create at that moment. And then when a recording artist, say Frank Sinatra comes by and picks up that sheet music and starts singing and it's recorded, then the person who's making the recording is um, gonna have a separate copyright and they're recording of that version of the song. Um, so you can have multiple copyrights involving um, one written uh, piece of music. One of the first screens that you showed um, was in, in terms of the constitutional rights. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what the timing is of, uh, is of that because you have lots of uh, early uh, musicians in the, uh, the 20th century that were basically ripped off. You know, they performed, there are, there are recordings of it. There are uh, even movies of it sometimes, uh, but they never saw a penny. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's important to note that what all the Constitution does is grant Congress the authority um, to create laws, right, to protect intellectual property. And then, and that's all it does. And then uh, it's really up to Congress to come up with the laws that protect intellectual property. Um, you'll be shocked to learn that Congress doesn't always do a great job um, <laughs> at protecting rights. So, uh, so throughout the history of the United States, Copyright protection has not been very robust. It really wasn't until the 1976 Act that artists really began to have, um, you know, rights to their creations. It's also important to note that, you know, this whole concept that, you know, we have to give artists rights in order to create works. Um, th there, there's some doubt about whether or not that's really true or not, right? If we're really going to get more works by giving art artists exclusive rights. There are some areas of artistic expression where there really isn't any protection. Um, most notably fashion, right? Because fashion is um, utilitarian, right? It's clothing, um, that there's not uh, copyright protection um, extended to, to fashion, uh, um, at least not very far. And so what you find in the fashion industry is they're constantly having to innovate, you know, new lines of clothes um, coming out, you know, every six or nine months. Are there any other questions? Yeah, yeah uh, we have a question. Elizabeth, if you, yes, if you um, are creating something like um, Elizabeth makes sometimes um, designs with, like, say, all the things that are around Michigan State buildings and different things, we've purchased like the trademark to use Sparty, but the rest of the things because they're buildings or other Sparty things, she doesn't have to purchase that if she makes it like into a ceramic piece or into. Um, into one of her sewing pieces or do you have to purchase for every all the different kinds of things like that like say say you're doing i know m22 is a street sign that was very someone took that and they they went crazy on that up north when you're doing things like that right so um right if you're going to take a bunch of pictures of landmarks say around um east lansing and uh, create sort of collage of of found uh artifacts or photographs 
you know, uh, of things that are significant around the city, um, that is going to be a protected work, copyrightable work. If you're doing mass productions of those and you're selling those and you're saying, you're mentioning uh, uh, Michigan State or Sparty or um, you're using symbols, it's probably a good idea at that point to get a copyright license um, from the university. Um, but it can also an argument can be made that, you know, you're not, all you're doing is, is creating creative work um, and that there really shouldn't be any confusion of people thinking it came from the university itself. Um, uh, but it's always wise to sort of get a license in that situation. Okay, but, but as far about, as the buildings are concerned, yeah. yeah, they, you know, again, you can take photographs of buildings. Um, you don't need a license from the architect. So built, but what about street signs and those, those things like M22 became so popular and became even a store. So that's a. Yeah. If you're taking a picture of the sign and you're using it as part of your collage or your artwork, um, I don't think M22, I, I'm not sure who and monetizing that as a trademark. Um, but they, they really couldn't make a, a claim against you that you're trademark since you're not using M22 at or you're taking a picture of yourself, right? This is iconic. And any other yeah, questions? Um, so in, like when artists covers of songs like Jimi Hendrix to Joe and a cover of on the Watchtower, is that made covers but he didn't let them try to sound exactly artists like does that work i'm trying to make a other song and i made but like i really like making my own bird does that work yeah is unique and then musical artists are allowed to make their own version of any song that they want um, when they do it, their recording of their version of that song will be uh, separately copyrightable, right? Um, but what they do is they have to pay what's called a statutory royalty back to the writer of the song. Um, so in the case of, uh, um, you know, it, it would be the person who wrote it too, not not the other people that did versions of it. Um, so if, uh, I don't know who originally performed Hey Joe, but... Um, you know, Jimi Hendrix would pay a royalty to the, uh, or his publisher is going to pay a royalty to whoever it was that actually wrote the song. And like, at what point do you like owe them that royalty? Yeah. Um, so typically artists work with um, sort of music publishers. Um, and so royalties are automatically paid when, when the artist is selling a reproduction of it. So if you did a version of Hey Joe, you put it on Apple, people downloaded that and paid it, um, uh, you would be responsible for making sure that uh, the statutory royalty for that recording um, went to whoever the, the publishing company was for Hey Joe. There's gonna be a publisher associated with those rights who's who's collecting and, and remitting the, the payments. And is it like a percentage royalty or yep. is it like a flat, like? It's a percentage typically, but there's gonna be a, uh, I believe there's a floor. And I, I should mention, yeah, again, okay. music is a very complicated area of copyright law. There are copyright um, lawyers who do nothing but music law. Mm -hmm. I'm not one of them. So I'm giving you the bare basics. But if you really need a copyright lawyer who's right. well-versed in um, in music law, I'm happy to make a referral for you. Yeah, uh, I was curious. Right. If it was like you pay like a $10,000 flat base, like pay out to the writer or if it's like if you sell like five songs you like give them like yeah i know that's like ridiculous but if you sell like five songs then you like give them like pennies off of that or something yeah yeah it, they're, they're gonna get a few cents for every copy of the song that's sold um so you might be writing them a check for you know 87 cents or something Um, my name is Sheila Morgan. I wanted to ask a question regarding um, copyright for music. Um, I'm getting ready to copyright 10 of my songs. Um, I want to know when I copyright them, are they protected before I copyright? 
if I do them, download them onto LA Studio. Yep. So as soon as you write that song and you recorded it, right, or you wrote it down on sheet music, you automatically um, have a copyright in the work and you are automatically protected. You get additional rights when you register the copyright with the copyright office. Um, and, um, but the copyright already exists. You're just letting the copyright office know about it and they're registering it. Um, and you fill out a um, copyright registration form and you pay, I think, $25 for, piece, for each work. So if you have 10 songs, um, you know, it's going to be uh, 250 bucks. And then um, you'll pay them and you'll, you'll send in your copyright registrations. And then at that point, you get additional rights if someone were to um, infringe on your work. But it's, it's important that if you are going to register your copyright, that you do that before you make it available for download commercially. Um, because you only get the benefit of those rights for anyone that infringes on you after you've, you've registered it. Mm. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Well, Matt, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, happy, happy to join. We all guys. appreciate your information. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Matt. Happy to.